In episode number 412 of the Reasons I'm Broke podcast, we cover Funko's latest comic shop exclusives. We also have the next crossover from IDW. What will they think of next? This week's comic book highlight was forced to be Sonic the Hedgehog Annual 2020. No complaints, but there is a reason. All of this and so much more on today's show. Hello and welcome to your award-winning The Reasons I'm Broke podcast, bringing you the reasons we're broke every single week, ranging from comics, movies, TV, video games, and more. I am Team Magma... Magma? (laughs) Team Magma Grunt (laughs) Daniel? Team Magma. (laughs) (laughs) And I am your emperor. (laughs) Would I have to be like, Pale (laughs) Pakeli? For changing it up? (laughs) For those of you new to the show, the way we format it is first we go through some news, we head into the Patreon shoutouts, which are thank yous to all of you who make the show possible, we head into our comic book review, and we finish it off with the Brokep Block, which is what Palpa Kelly and I have been doing this week. Our first piece of news comes from the small screen television and something I really didn't think we were ever going to see again. What would you do if I sang <laughs> out of tune? You're already doing it. I would just, I am, yeah. just keep on going with the show. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> so original series creator Neil Marlins and star Fred Savage are teaming up to reboot The Wonder Years for ABC. How do you reboot the Wonder Years for the 2020s? This coming-of-age comedy will focus on a black middle-class family in late 1960s Alabama. Okay, not the direction I think they would take, but awesome. I'm glad it's still taking place in the past, which is what the original show did as well. And I think that was a smart move by them instead of trying to literally modernize it Mm -hmm. and have it take place during this period. (laughs) These are not the Wonder Years, (laughs) so definitely not. The original series ran for six seasons from 1988 to 1993. You were in love with this show. I still am. This is when I saw in elementary school. I grew up watching it even before then. My mom would watch a lot of these episodes. Mm So as uh, a lot of what she watched, I ended up enjoying and growing up with. And One the Years is one that easily stood the test of time. There's a lot of great episodes in there that talk about childhood and into your teens and eventually college. A lot of lessons that are to be learned and a a lot of ones that I think we all reflect with. It was like the Boy Meets World before Boy Meets World. Pretty much. Did you ever catch any of these? Yeah, we used to watch a lot together. I remember watching it with you. It never really drew me in. I I don't feel there was really any character that I connected with in this show. So I can see why I really like it, especially if that's something that you grew up with. But I was definitely in my 20s before I watched any of these. And it just probably doesn't hold the same amount of nostalgia for me. One of the biggest problems that this show had was the soundtrack, which was, of course, amazing. But when you get into the DVD portions and eventually, I don't even know if it's available now as a digital release, but it became a headache because of all the licensing. Mm -hmm. They tried to re-air them and sell them with replaced music, music that they did have the rights to, and it just didn't play the same. So I think that's one of the biggest issues that this show had as far as its longevity in post airing sales but i know it did hit netflix like three or four years ago which is i think when we were watching it Mm -hmm. and that's when they had settled out most of the licensing and there's a few episodes where they had to replace the music but for the most part it was intact the character that i remember the most was the gym teacher (laughs) (laughs) coach cutlip yeah he was pretty great We met him at Megacon Mm -hmm. like six, seven years ago. He had all of his Star Trek stuff laid out and I was the one who asked for the Coach Cutlip one. And he's like, yeah, I do have a photo. And he reaches into his (laughs) bag and he has the Coach Cutlip one. And it says, he wrote in it, he signed it. And it was something like, be fit, stay strong. And then he signed it. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Do you think any of the original cast or even Fred Savage are going to show up as, not n- themselves, because this is, right. takes place in the 60s, but just as like regular characters? I am 90% sure Fred Savage is going to throw himself in there because I feel like he always cameos. Like he showed up in Boy Meets World a few mm-hmm. times. And I feel like there's other things that we've seen Wonder Years characters in. Didn't the dad show up in something? 
He showed up in Boy Meets World as well. Did he? I, but I felt he show, showed up as himself. Like, I thought he died of a heart attack, but then he showed up in something. And I was like, oh, maybe he didn't. Anyway, I digress. Maybe I dreamt it, and it was a great dream. <laughs> but I, yeah, you know, we may see a few of them. Obviously, they're not going to be who they were, but I don't see any reason that they wouldn't do that cameo for people who are longtime fans of the show. This one is set to start airing in the 2021 and 2022 TV season, something I definitely want to catch. Do you remember what Fred Savage's character was in Boy Meets World? Yeah, the creepy teacher. Wasn't he like trying to sleep with Topanga or something? Yes, he was the college professor that was trying to get with Topanga. Yeah. And the whole time, even now, like back then when I was watching it, I'm like, that's just fucking Kevin <laughs> Arnold. There's no way he's trying to seduce anyone. Like he he doesn't play it well. Right. But that's maybe because I know him from that show. Well, I also think it's hilarious because he and Ben Savage, Ben Savage, is that his name? That sounds right. His brother. Yeah. Yeah. They look exactly the same. Mm. So they were supposed to be playing like obviously not brothers. And I'm like, nah, you two are just brothers. I still like uh, Fred's cameo in Seinfeld. It's when Kramer goes to California mm -hmm. and he's trying to make it and he's trying to sell his script and he catches Fred Savage in the cafe and he pretty much forces the script on him and scares him out of the fucking restaurant, the cafe. It was really funny. And he plays basically Kevin Arnold also right. in that. I feel like he's never played anything except Kevin Arnold. Not really. Yeah. That's he, the the wizard, though. He does play Kevin Arnold again, but that's probably the second biggest thing I would say he's known for the with wizard. people our age. That's the video game movie where they first showed Super Mario Brothers 3. And that's with his oh, little brother who yeah, was like yeah. really good at video games. I do. I remember what you're talking about. I've only seen it once, so I don't even remember him in there. But I am excited for this reboot of the Wonder Years, especially since it is taking place during a separate time. I don't even know if you would need to call it a reboot because it's just a different story during mm -hmm. that era. All of these stories are still based in real things that happen. Like of they course. talk about the moon landing in the Wonder Years. So I see it as just another telling in that particular universe. Obviously, you're not going to see this character show up again. Mm -hmm. But one of the advantages that this has is because it's called the Wonder Years, it doesn't need to work as hard to find itself that audience because I'm already in and then focusing on a different demographic during the 1960s, I think that's going to catch a lot of people today too. Absolutely. I, I think it's a smart move to make. Yeah, if you're going to release this, I think now is the right time to do it. So I'm excited to see what happens and, and you know the potential characters that we could see in it. But that was a bit of news that I had to throw in there because the one of the years is such a personal thing for me. I love the show. But from here on now, it is comic book and merchandise news. A little bit light this week, nothing heavy. So we're going to see what we get out of this this week. We still have the comic book review and mm -hmm. then, of course, what's going on with the show and with our lives. We've got first IDW. As we mentioned in the very beginning, IDW is publishing a new crossover the one I know that we've all been waiting for, <laughs> which is Back to the Future and Transformers. Is that any weirder than My Little Pony and Transformers or Terminator and Transformers? Terminator and Transformers, I can see. I can get on board with that one. And even My Little Pony and Transformers, because I feel like the audiences are so similar almost. But this, I, I just, I don't see it. I don't feel that it was anything that we needed. Apparently we do, and I love this crossover. We need more crossovers in comics, and I'm glad we glad we're getting them. Okay, I'm glad too, but I also feel, I also feel like a bunch of people sat in a room and they said, "This is what we own." Yes, let's get drunk and put two of them together. Well, it's like this is all we have, so let's fucking make it happen. <laughs> like, what would you cross over with Back to the Future? Let's say you had all the licensing. Mm -hmm. What are the the time traveling characters, or really anything you would cross over with Back to the Future? I have all the licensing. Like yeah, everything. Ex except for Batman, because Batman works oh, with everything. Damn it. I would have put Batman. <laughs> that was my choice. What would you put with it? I'm not a fan of the show, but Morty and Rick, because that's what it's loosely okay, based on yeah. anyway. But I feel like, okay, out of what we've seen, like I would do Terminator with Back to the Future before I would do Back to the Future and Transformers. Why is that? Just because they also go to the future. <laughs> oh, that, yeah, that's true. There's a lot of time traveling yeah, there. Yeah, so yeah, it would be like much darker than the Back to the Future tone, <laughs> but- Seeing Doc be like, great Scott, and then like he fucking figures out how to take down Skynet or whatever. Marty, he has a gun. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. I want to see that. I, I'm excited for this. I'm going to read it. The DeLorean has to be a Transformer. It has to turn into one. Of course it does. At some point. 
when they did Star Trek in Transformers, the fucking Enterprise ended up being a Transformer. Oh my God, so. stop. It was not. <laughs> it, was, it looked really cool, too. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, yeah, it's the coolest and Transformer. DeLorean's going to look really cool, too. <laughs> I, I can't wait for this. Speaking of the DeLorean, somebody had a DeLorean in my parking lot the other day. I didn't tell you because I forgot, but now I remembered. They're really cool, right? Yeah, but like, no, but it was like the DeLorean. No, yeah, like, they were real cars. No, but like made to look like the one from Back to the Future. Oh, so I had like the little thing in the yeah. middle, of the console thing. It was all, it was all done up. It was really cool. I feel like you kind of have to if you own a DeLorean. Yeah, I mean, if you're gonna invest in that and keep that car running, <laughs> then yeah, you might as well. The solicitation for IDW's book reads: "Quote." Marty McFly has just returned to his sweet home of Hill Valley, 1985, and everything's looking up. That is, until Marty and his friend Doc Brown's time machine attracts the attention of the Decepticons. <laughs> With one small mistake, Marty finds himself thrust into adventure to stop the Decepticon plot in the past, present, and future, all with the help of a new time machine, the Autobot Gigawatt. I can't. I just, I can't. I can't deal with that. Gigawatt? <laughs> You need a ton of gigawatts to make that thing go into the past and into the future. So that's a perfect Transformers name. <laughs> Once again, they sat around and they got drunk and they said, let's name it Gigawatt, Gigawatts, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> this miniseries lands on Back to the Future's 35th anniversary and will publish as a four issue mini. Do you think we're going to see the Wild West in this? Do we have to see like at least one panel of the Wild West? I have no idea what time period they're going to go in. If I had to guess, maybe the far future, like even further than I think they said tw it was the 2000s when they went into the future in this in the second movie. But I don't know if we'll get any throwback to the Wild West or even into the original movie. I feel like we have this opportunity really have to tie in at least a panel, right? At least maybe they're time traveling somewhere and they pop up in a few different places and you get to see those things because then really hardcore fans are going to be like, oh shit, there it is. Issue number one is set to release in October. Is there anything special that you really, really just have to see in this? Like, that's what would make this comic for you. It's just seeing the, the DeLorean turn into yeah. a Transformer. Like, that's we just got it with Power Rangers and TMNT where they switched and the Power Rangers had morph or the Turtles had morphing suits and we got a giant TMNT Megazord. Like, that's all we needed. And it was just Shell, what is it, Metalhead? Yeah, I love Metalhead. Metalhead. Oh, man, why didn't you tell me about this? Why am I just learning about this now? Because you weren't reading the book. You should have read the I'm book. I'm not. It was pretty good. I'm too busy reading romance novels. And playing your Magikarp And playing, game. listen, that game's awesome. I have the best Magikarps. I've just resorted to naming them names like Karen and Monica because I've run out of carp names. I think you have an addiction. So? <laughs> There's worse addictions. There are worse addictions than Magikarp Jump. Something out of Image Comics this week. They have sent Negan Lives number one back for a second printing, and it's still not being made available digitally. This was an initiative by Image Comics to help comic shops. It was interesting how they ended up sending this out to shops because they gave out copies based on how many you ordered of the, I think, final issue of The Walking Dead, hmm. one of those orders, and they matched them as best as they could, and then there were allocations after that. But they, those were given to comic shops to help them out after the coronavirus closures, and they were done at just a shipping charge in that case. Hmm. And then comic shops could order additional copies after the fact, but they went out of print really quickly. And and they sold out really quickly too. The silver variants, there were two per shops. And then there was a gold foil variant, which was one per store. And those, again, were to help out stores during all of this, especially with the publishing being cut down to what it is. It was definitely a very nice boost for comic stores. When they actually give us something that we can actually move, that's the actual help. When they don't make something returnable or where you're like Marvel and you instead give out free copies of books that we can't sell anyway, that's not help because then we're just getting charged for shipping. I applaud Image Comics for this and it was a book that people definitely came out with, came out for because he is one of the more popular Walking Dead characters. It is really great that they did this for comic shops and I think that was... I mean, obviously something that's built your loyalty with them mm. because you know that they have your back. Did you read this first issue? 
because who cares <laughs> about Negan? <laughs> Uh, everyone loved him though, because I remember when Jeffrey Dean Morgan played him mm-hmm. in the TV show. That's when he really blew up in popularity, and that's when people wanted to get the comics that featured him. People were coming in telling me all about him, even though I told them they're like, "Do you watch Walking Dead?" I'm like, "No, I it's not for me." Well, let me tell you about this Negan guy, and I'm like, "What the hell?" And they would tell me everything about him and how he's got this baseball bat and he just murdered some cast member. I know Jeffrey Dean Morgan did an amazing job in it. But holy shit, were the fan fans like really, really riled up for him. So do you like fans or the Palpa better? Why are those two? Because <laughs> like... who <laughs> cares? I'm really glad that they like this character. I have heard a lot about Negan too and his baseball bat. And all the women on Facebook were like, ooh, Negan and his baseball bat. And I'm like, <laughs> he's, he's really not attractive, but whatever. Wasn't for me. I'll be very curious to see how the second printings do for Negan Lives. Something else on the horizon that's going to help out comic shops, Funko is releasing two comic shop exclusive Marvel Funko Pops consisting of Carnage from Donny Cates, Absolute Carnage Comics, and Doctor Doom from his look after Civil War II. Doctor Doom is a standard size pop at $13.99 and Carnage sits at a deluxe edition with a full base for $28.99. Hmm. You know what else about these pops? I care about them. They're going to do good. They're going to help out the store. I know you don't. Zero percent. If you told me they're releasing a big ass Pikachu, the, the solicitation could literally be big ass Pikachu <laughs> and Dad Jita. I'd be all about it. Here's all my monies. Much like the Batman Who Laughs Funko Pop that they also made a comic shop exclusive. They made the Saga Pops Funko exclusives. Oh, yeah. They're ones that I know will do great for shops and have done great for shops, but wouldn't do well, I don't think, anywhere else. Maybe the Carnage is is the exception because anything symbiote, people will buy up. I can see these selling at Target, but they made them specific because the readers know who this iteration of Carnage is. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like your standard Carnage, it's directly from the Absolute Carnage series. And the same goes for someone like the Batman Who Laughs, where even now people come in and they'll point to him and they're like, oh, who's this guy? The funniest one I've had so far is they're like, is this like an evil gambit? Because he has a trench coat. I'm like, no, that's that's a DC character. (laughs) Evil gambit. Evil gambit. I've had the Batman Who Smiles. Oh, that's a good one. I like that one because Batman never smiles. So right, so <laughs> it, it makes sense. But this, I would I'm, say, I would say the Batman who giggles. There You're you like, go. That's who it is. He giggles. I've had some pre-orders already for the Carnage Funko Pop, and it does come with this really cool base on it. It's not a ten-inch pop like the Pikachu one that you were talking about. Yeah, it's Pikachu, but it is like a a wider one. If that mm-hmm. makes sense, it's more like a base diorama Funko Pop than it is an oversized one, okay. and it's really neat. If you're into Absolute Carnage or Donny Cates. Not me. Doctor Doom one, I it looks cool, but I don't see it doing too well mm-hmm. outside of pre-orders. And even then, I've gotten zero so far. But maybe no one knows about it yet. I know even the Absolute Carnage one, I had to tell the biggest Carnage fans that do shop at the store, like, hey, there's this Carnage pop coming out that's exclusive. And they're like, yeah, put me down for it. So I think if I were to put out the Doctor Doom one somewhere, people would come out for it. How? the hell does Funko have all this space to release all these things? It must just be incredibly easy to change out the molds. I saw the documentary Mm -hmm. on Funko. It was on Netflix, I want to say, and they have artists that specifically translate these characters into that Funko form. It goes through different iterations. If you work with someone like Nintendo, they give you very little wiggle room as to how much you can make it look like a Funko. It's basically... Have it be the exact Pokemon, but you can change the eyes, I guess. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, that's how it is with Nintendo. (laughs) I guess. So, I know they have to go through approval processes when you do work with these licensed characters, Mm -hmm. but they make it work. And sometimes it doesn't work. Some of these pops aren't meant to be taken out of the box. They just won't stand up. But I don't know if more recently they've made them better. I think most collectors, though, just keep them in their boxes. But even things like baseball players. Who's buying baseball player Funkos? Very few. I think they mainly carry them in the gift shops for Mm, those stadiums. I can see that happening. That makes sense. And every now and again, a subscriber will order one from previews. If it's a player that they like or if it's a team that they like, they do the mascots up Mm, as Funkos. I mean, that's cool. That's one one way and it'll work, but they're not too common. Definitely not something I would just carry, <laughs> like on the on a whim, hoping it would sell. Oh, come on. Just get all the baseball players. <laughs> all of them. Tell your boss. It'll be fine. Just we'll burn sell. money. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll sell them. 
since we're a little bit lighter on news this week, I didn't put any of the recent updates that Zack Snyder had put up on Vero about his cut of the film, but maybe it's something that you and I can talk about, maybe something you didn't hear yet. And one of them is, I think, the one in which he talked about how his cut of the film is different than the 2017 version that he was going to release theatrically. He said the 2017 version of Justice League before Joss was around was a compromised version between him and the studios. But he said that Zack Snyder's Justice League that we're getting on HBO Max next year is zero compromise. In a way, doesn't that make the critics correct of we're never getting the Snyder Cut <laughs> if they meant the 2017 version? If they mean that, and and they'll probably, you could be like, look, we're getting the, oh, but they meant the 2017 one. <laughs> but I'll go back to a statement that I had a few episodes ago with It sucks that all this happened, right? It sucks that it was changed. It sucks that they made him compromise, X, Y, and Z. But for all that to happen to get you this uncompromised film, is that all not kind of worth it? That is a very positive way to look at it, where we are getting what he initially wanted even before he started filming 2017. I would say it's probably his plan from before we got the critic reviews during BVS, Mm because that's what caused that massive shakeup. I love that he's telling us this. I feel like he's just giving us more and more information and get everybody more and more excited. And I love when people ask him things about the Joss version and he's like, what are you talking about? Right. (laughs) Where he pretends like he doesn't know what that is. Right. There's the one of Wonder Woman where she has that red scarf thing Mm -hmm. around there, that decoration. I don't know what that's called, but it's where they were trying to set up that romance between Wonder Woman and Batman. And they showed him the screenshot and they said, hey, will this be in your, was this your scene or someone else's? And he just replied with, what movie is that from? (laughs) Little things like that. I love the way he responds. Do you think he still has not seen Justice League? If At the very least, he knows what has happened or Mm -hmm. what got changed or added because so many fans have pointed these things out to him. Like the Superman Flash race. He's like, what's that from? And, you know, things like that. So he's probably pieced it together by now if he hasn't seen it. That's his nightmare sequence. Yeah, (laughs) seriously. (laughs) (laughs) The other thing too was, and I think we all already knew that he was bringing this version back, but he confirmed that we're getting the look of Steppenwolf from BVS and not the one that we ended up getting in Justice League. Yeah, I think we all pretty much assumed that that would happen once he was given that money and given that rain to change it even if it had been the 2017 version of Snyder's I I assume that we would get what he had intended for Steppenwolf back these things being changed to his original plan we're seeing Ben Affleck back in Batman shape so there's a lot of speculation that now we're going to start getting that additional photography that he wanted to use to make the film that he originally wanted Mm -hmm. to make not his 2017 theatrical cut but literally Zack Snyder's Justice League it's not Zack Snyder's cut of Justice League or director's cut it's a completely different version of this do you think that this means now that he is inputting he said no compromise so do you think he's inputting some things in this film that lead into Justice League 2 and 3 or that full five film arc I don't see why he wouldn't right if you have this opportunity and again whether they make those other ones or not do what you plan to do, do what you want to do, your initial vision. And at worst, they just don't make any more. And at best, they say, wow, this was extremely well received. We see what you're doing. We want to promote and support that so that you can continue doing what you had planned, even if it's just for HBO Max release, right? I don't think there's If that's the only way we can get it, nobody's going to say no. (laughs) Like no fan is going to be like, well, I can't have it in the theater on the big screen. So no, like, no, that's not what this movement. That's not what these fans are about. So I think it would be really foolish of him not to include everything that he could have as if it were continuing because there's always that hope that it could. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't, then it just doesn't. And yeah, maybe there's some unanswered things that you then answer on Vero. And you'd be like, I put this in here because this was the initial plan. Plus, if he doesn't, who do you think is going to be there to rally together and tell AT&T that we are ready to pay money for more and ready for more campaigns? You know it. 
Right We're after, gonna be right fucking there. Right after you stop silent crying after watching <laughs> <laughs> watching this movie, the credits are gonna roll, and I'm gonna look over, and you'll just have these tears rolling down your cheeks so poetically. <laughs> and then the next thing you'll do is take out your phone and be like, <laughs> "Release the Snyderverse." That's the hashtag right there. there That's you go. exactly the one that we've been using already. <laughs> oh, damn it! I thought I came up with something cool. How important do you think it is for them to have introduced the multiverse aspect to the DC universe by saying that there are all these different versions of these characters? Flash, we've already seen the mm-hmm. TV and the film version cross over. How, how important do you think that is for the company when they're trying to give us Zack Snyder's Justice League and Battenson's Batman and we're getting the Flash film over here, which may or may not have some of those aspects of the multiverse in there? Do you think that's an easier, softer way of saying... No, it's not a reboot of Batman. It's a multiverse version. And here's a Keaton version as well. And you can enjoy whichever one you want. I think it's a really interesting and creative way to do it that I don't... So often we just see reboots of things. So especially with who the character The Flash is, yeah, that's the perfect way to do it, right? And still incorporate all these things since they'll say everything that you love is still okay. And... (laughs) With them announcing now that that's what they're doing, yeah, it makes total sense. Like, yeah, we can keep continuing Snyder if we want to and still have the plans with these other things. He also did say we're going to get another teaser before that full trailer during DC Fandom. I think that'll probably be during Justice Con. The very first teaser kind of gave us a little bit more of the history lesson. Do you think the other one will be Black Suit Superman? No, that'd be awesome. But no, you're going to wait and you're going to surprise us with that in the movie. I think the other teaser will probably be the other nightmare sequence. The one that Cyborg sees? Mm -hmm. That'd be great. That'd be awesome. Would love that. Hopefully we get a better look as well at Nightmare Flash in this version of the film. Oh, it could also be the original look of Steppenwolf. I wouldn't be surprised if that's the other teaser too. Oh, I gotcha. Yeah, that'd Mm -hmm. be a good one too. Very excited to see what we end up getting, and we will absolutely report it right here as it releases. Can I record you watching the Snyder Cut? (laughs) If you want. Just for everyone, we'll live stream it, so tears. Sure. (laughs) That's that's all I want, It's just your tears. Didn't even cry on our wedding day, but he'll cry. (laughs) Didn't cry when Leo was born. (laughs) But that does actually wrap up our news for the week. Like Daniel said, it was a much lighter news week. Let's head into our Patreon shoutouts of the week. These are our thank yous to everyone who makes the show possible. First goes out to Kat. You can find her on Instagram at underscore our nest. Kat posted an image of a beautiful moth that visited her garden. That's a project she's also undertaken Mm -hmm. is putting together a garden outdoors. Beautiful too. And with her photography page, she probably gets all kinds of visitors that you normally don't attract when you just have a regular backyard or or whatever. So definitely check out her Instagram at underscore our nest to see the progress of this and all of the different animals that she's seen. Speaking of gardens, we have a pineapple. Yeah. (laughs) Rando pineapple growing in our yard. We've got two. There's one on the left side and one on the right side, but the one on the left has actually gotten pretty big. Well, there's not a pineapple growing on the right side, right? There's just a pineapple plant. There was, and it might have gotten picked off. Oh, yeah. It's gone. But there's definitely a pineapple on the left side. I opened the blinds the other day, and I was like, the fuck is a pineapple doing out there? <laughs> Leo got super excited, and like the first thing he did was slammed his hand on it. No, that hurt. <laughs> spiny. Very spiny. Next shout out this week goes out to Matt on Twitter, at Mr. Forklift. You can also check out his film website, typingaboutmovies.com. Matt retweeted this message from at Dr. Self 1209, which reads, quote, friends, remember this. You are the most powerful influence and contributing author to the narrative that will be your child's reference point with which they view the world, end quote. Very important to remember something that I think we all mess up as parents, Mm -hmm. but hopefully we recognize and correct as we continue. I think it's like it reminds me of Louis C.K.'s joke of, well, that's a fuck up right there. That'll, that'll change them for life. <laughs> That's going to scar them. They'll, re- they'll remember that. I mean, yeah. And you never really know what's going to star- scar your kid because it could be something random. My mom mm-hmm. changed my Barney curtains when I was young and I've never forgotten. Threw those bitches in the trash and lied to me about it. 
for me, it was in kindergarten where I did not want to go into the classroom. Mm. And she said, I'll be right outside. And then I went in the classroom. I look outside the window. She was she not was waiting gone. outside. No, she told me she went to get her nails done or something. <laughs> <laughs> and I, re- I still remember that to this day. I know. She feels so guilty. So, and I, I'm now I'm like, all right, let's see what Leo remembers. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably the time we told him we give him chocolate and then we didn't. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> Next shout out this week goes out to Jared on Twitter at Spoon Sandwich. Jared came on to do Two-Face Parts 1 and 2 for our Batman the Animated Series commentary. Those release later this and next month, one month early on Patreon first, and then it goes out publicly. Thank you so much, Jared, for coming on and doing the commentary with me. And our final shout out goes out to Scott on Twitter at LazyGamingGuys or at Pandanime. Scott streamed Shenmue on their channel. We call it Scott Moo. That's one that Al from <laughs> from Purple Swordfish Scott came up Moo. with. What's Shin Moo? That guy who runs around and fights? Yeah, although that first game has a lot of exploration, some mm. puzzle solving, not as action based. But those but are your favorite things, is exploring everything. I couldn't really get into this game, but mm. I think it was more because of nostalgia. My br- my buddy played this all the time in, on the Dreamcast. And back then, it was revolutionary. It did a lot for gaming, and it did a lot of firsts for gaming as well, which is why i think it's so iconic and so remembered but scott and the lazy gaming guys they stream every single wednesday night at about 10 30 eastern time if you're like daniel you'll just giggle the whole time so thanks again this week to cat matt jared and scott for your patreon support if you too would like your shout out every single month for as little as one dollar a month that's 25 cents sometimes less than 25 cents an episode you too can become a patreon backer Every bid helps us out. So if you feel like you're getting a dollar or more's worth of entertainment or information every single month, head on over to patreon.com slash the reasons I'm broke. But as always, our show will always be free. The most important thing you can do is tell a friend. Word of mouth is the most effective in growing podcast channels. You know, it's also effective just taking their phones and subscribing, especially if they have an iPhone. Mm-hmm. Apple podcast is the biggest podcasting platform. Is it really? by a huge amount. Mm. I think the next biggest one now is Spotify, but it's like, I don't know, 20% of the market, if that. Spotify is the biggest music streaming platform. Did you know that? Yeah, I knew that. And at one point it was Pandora, iHeartRadio. I thought I was like learning something in class and I could teach you, but apparently not. Let's head into our comic book highlight of the week. This week, by default, it is Sonic the Hedgehog Annual 2020 number one. This one's written by Ian Flynn, Caleb Goldner, Sarah Grayley, Sam King, and Gigi Detru. Art by Jonathan Gray, Evan Stanley, Aaron Hammerstrom, Lamar Wells, Jamal Peppers, and Abigail Bomer, with colors by Reggie Graham, Bacardi Curry, and Priscilla Tromontano. Ooh, Tromontano. That's one of the best colorist names I've heard in a while. So DC Comics dropped the ball this week, and it's the first week we went through their new distributor that they, one of two, and they didn't ship them on time. One of many comic stores that didn't get their DC Mm -hmm. shipment on time. So we'll go into that on the Brokehead block, but because of that, the only comic that we received that we're actually reading was Sonic the Hedgehog this week. So by default, it was Sonic. I have not really been reading Sonic. I knew enough to keep up, which is some robots are taking over the world and Zombots. turning people into zombies and Eggman started it all. Mm-hmm. I don't know why he wants the world to be zombies because why are you ruling zombies? That's boring. So he turns them into Zombots, which are robots and he controls robots. Oh, okay. So. Gotcha. So yeah, I knew enough to keep up, but this is like a typical annual where it's several shorter comics focused on different characters. A lot of it fills in the gaps between the different stories and the different issues. And even some of them continued the annual from last year. And last year, I think the Zombot story was still going on. So some of that might be because of the closures. And I know Mm. some of the Sonic issues were delayed for a few months there where it should have released one week and then it got pushed back a couple of weeks. So it seems like the Zombot story has been going on for so long, but it actually hasn't when you break down the issues. Like, yeah, it's a longer form story, but we're pretty much getting to the end of it now. And the annual helps fill in those gaps, tells you where Big the Cat was Mm -hmm. during all of this and where some of the villains sort of stand 
and how they're trying to survive. I really like the Big the Cat one. I've never been a big, big person. <laughs> <laughs> the only real experience I have with him was from Sonic DX, mm. which is a remake of whatever it was, where you just fish. And you're trying to catch that frog and you just fish. People hated the Big the Cat levels. I it remember was, that. They were very difficult. They were not fun levels. And I played, I think, through most of them, but they just weren't awesome. <laughs> they didn't bring them back in two. Well, yeah, because it was just not a great time. But I did really enjoy his story. I think if I had, of course, really been following what was going on, it would make a lot more sense, right? Where he's going through all these different places looking for this frog and... Seeing all these things happen, and of course he's playing it down, but if you've read and you understand what's going in the story, you're like, oh, that's that moment, and that's that moment, and you know, this is when this is happening. But the kicker was the end, and I was like, <gasps> heart attack. It's such a dark fucking story from yeah. Ian Flynn. I think the darkest Sonic one we've gotten so far from IDW, too. But it was so great, and my heart hurt. The second, the second story in the book, I think, was actually overall my favorite, though, with these two rando characters. I have no <laughs> idea who they are, like Owl Man and Cluckety Cluck over there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just a really great, well-told story of there's this essentially zombie apocalypse, and there's one radio station that's still functioning, and they're needed to stay there to get this the word out to survivors on, hey, meet here with other survivors so that you can survive too. And then in the end, you know, they about to die. They gonna be zombies too. I really liked how the annual itself was, instead of it being unrelated short stories that you often see come out of comic publishers, it really does read better when you're reading it alongside the Zombot story. Mm -hmm. It's not standalone, but I think that it's better because you get to see where these characters have been or what these original characters even are doing to try to help others during this really apocalypse that's happening in the Sonic universe. Is Eggman and that duck guy together? Are they a thing? I think the duck guy has a thing for Eggman, mm -hmm. but it's not reciprocated. Because that was really weird when he's like, oh, you have this statue of me this that whatever toy thing yeah, yeah. and uh, he was like mm, and eggman's like oh time for you to go and i'm like what's <laughs> going on here i think the joke was that he wanted to control him too and right. that, that's why it was kind of weird but even then before i read this annual it does seem like he really likes eggman yeah because i feel like the one other issue i read i was like what's going on here <laughs> Definitely a good companion piece for Sonic. I know a lot of readers in general like to skip out on annuals, especially the superhero ones. But every now and again, you get a solid one that does go really well with the main series. And I think this one is is that exception and definitely one you should pick up if you're reading Sonic. I would definitely agree, even not being someone who regular re regularly reads Sonic or is very invested in the story. There were still a few... A few of the stories within this book that I really got something out of. All right, let's head into the final segment of today's show. It is the Brokep Block, what Palpa Kelly and I have been doing this week. But first and more importantly, more important than anything that we did this week is what we do every week, and that is release a podcast. And it is time, Brokats, to nominate us for the Podcast Awards 2020. We're trying to go for the fourth year in a row to get nominated and our second year in a row as a win. We ended up winning last year under games and hobbies thanks to the Brocad Core and we're trying to do it again this year and get nominated also for the first time under the category of People's Choice. So head on over to podcastawards.com, click on Choose Your Nominations and we'll be in the pull down menu under People's Choice and under Games and Hobbies if enough Brocad Core members this month you got to do it before July 31st, go in and nominate us. Then we will be in the slate for nominations. And then in August, the voting begins. And just so everyone knows, one of the reasons I'm broke, correct? Yes. So you just got to keep on scrolling. Go down to the T's. T's, the reasons I'm broke. I had mentioned the DC books this week. I was not happy <laughs> with that. Um, we got all our Marvel books. We got our independent books, but no DC books because they came from a different shipment because they came from a different distributor. And because of that, we're not getting them until maybe Friday at wow. the earliest. So I was, I'm obviously I'm frustrated, but there's nothing I can do about it. Mm -hmm. And it's not on us. We submitted our numbers. We did what we were supposed to do. This is all on the distributor. So I made that known as well. Customers that were like, hey, no DC books. 
No, and here's why. It's all on DC, very quick to put it on them because- Yeah, it's their it's, fault. Yeah, and it sucks because I. it's mainly what we read is mm-hmm. DC books, but there's nothing we can do. And I, I told a lot of subs and some of them were like, okay, well, I'll just come back this weekend then pick up those or i'll just call in friday and see if they actually arrived but that does it created four times the fucking work though because the way the system works a little inside baseball is it generates the forms like okay so here's kelly and here's all the books that she sub to then it goes down alphabetically to the next subscriber so i pull the books every tuesday based on what's on that list and it goes from all publishers with DC, since they're no longer with Diamond, it doesn't generate the list mm. like it does with every other publisher. So what I had to do, and I have to do this every week until we figure something out or the program itself works itself out or we get something from DC, is I have to pull up the list for every single issue that comes out. So, for example, Batman 99, and it gives me the list of all the names. All right, then I got to pull up the list of the variants of Batman 99. And then I got to look and see who's down for just the variants and who's down for just the main covers and cross out the names from there. If I'm doing cross pulls, let's say for DC Stead Planet, I pull up everyone that's down for DC Stun Killables. And then I generate a list now of everyone that's down for Dead Planet. And I compare the list and I cross out the names so we don't double pull. And then I do the same for the cross pulls. I have to do that for every single issue wow. now instead of it generating a list for me. It takes me four times the amount of Mm -hmm. time to fulfill those DC books. And when we're doing a full shipment, it's going to take us twice as long, especially on a heavy DC week until something better comes along. And it's all because of DC's foolishness and trying to go with this other distributor. Their reasons are their own and I don't know it yet. And that's frustrating to me because I at least I would I I would hope I'd have some understanding Mm -hmm. of I get why they're doing this. But we have no answers and they're not giving us answers. And until then, I still have to deal with these frustrations. And part of that is getting books days late and subs asking, is that going to be every week? And me saying, that's up to them. That's not up to me. That's up to the distributors. I wish I had an answer. I don't. They're not giving me answers. Some comic shops are getting their books on time. Others like mine are not. If only Steve wasn't being shady. Don't put this on Steve. (laughs) We like Steve Jeppy. (laughs) You like him now, but when he's sending you all those boxes with air. (laughs) I do hope that the DC shipments come in better and that we get... That's another thing. Now we have to... So damages before, I would Mm -hmm. generate them on a list, send them to Diamond and say, this is the number and this is the number of damages and send them all in a report. With DC's distributor, they want pictures of every damaged book. So are you fucking kidding me? Like that's even more time that it's going to take. It was like when we got that email of, hey, by the way, they want us to send in pictures. And this is the company that is involved with a large, probably the largest online comic chain around. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to name them, but they want pictures of these books. And when that news came, it was already after we knew we weren't getting our books on time. It was just like, yeah, of course. (laughs) Why (laughs) wouldn't it be? It just wasn't even a shock. It was just funny. You know where it gets so bad that you just find things funny? That's what it was. So that was my shipment week. And that's what it's going to be every week. Well, listen, I'm not saying Steve doesn't need pictures because he already made a lot of money off of this box. (laughs) But that's probably it. (laughs) It could be. How was your week, though? My week was good. My week was interesting. I was given a wonderful opportunity to help kind of put my foot into... The next role, right, if I continue to move up the ladder and kind of learn different ways to troubleshoot different problems and gain a little more confidence in myself, which is great because I'm still loving what I do. And even though I see that next role still being several years down the road, it's a wonderful, not really honor, but like confidence boost to understand that my boss still thinks highly enough of me that at some point, Mm -hmm. you know, I will be ready for that. So I've worked every day this week (laughs) because of it, help covering and answering phone calls. And even though it's not like a full eight hour day, right? I still have to stop my day to to do things. So that was mostly my week. I'm still fully immersed in Magikarp Jump. Right. Which is such a fun game. And it's so easy. Five minutes and I'm all caught up with what I need to do. And then I can do something again in an hour and a half or whenever I have the opportunity, right? But just a fun little way to shut my brain off for a few minutes and jump with my Magikarp. And I now 
know all the little tricks like even if I can't beat this league, I'm going to go and fight it because then at the end, maybe somebody will give me a training point and then I can gain even more jump points or whatever. And I just bought a little decoration that gives me nine extra training points. So I'm like leveling up even faster. I'm like, yeah, this is a shit. I don't know. I really enjoy it. Leo loves it too. He helps me like catch all the little berries and feed my fish. He asks for the fish game all the time. And most of the time I'm like, no, because it'll like click the wrong thing. And I'm like, oh, son of a bitch. (laughs) (laughs) Now I've lost. So it was just an average week um, getting back into the groove of things. I had a really crazy two weeks. And so just, you know, when you have like two or even one crazy week of work, it still takes a week or two before you really fall back into your routine. Trying to get caught up on school. It's going to be a wild semester, but, you know, is what it is. I'm learning how to find life on other planets. The answer is there is none. Right. But it's fine. I'm learning about it. We also had our third, fourth of July with Leo. Yeah, that was really, really great, except for getting eaten alive by mosquitoes, which (laughs) is a thing here in Florida. But he really enjoyed the fireworks. I think he was more present and understanding of what they were. He enjoyed getting to carry on sparklers and throw little poppers and, you know. Being chased by them. Being chased And really enjoying and spending time with the whole family. The fireworks that went up above the house, though, the ones he wasn't expecting that he couldn't see. Oh, man. Those spooked the shit out of him. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of funny, though, to see him run as quickly as possible (laughs) to the nearest, like, trusted adult. Yep. But he loved it. He enjoyed the fireworks. He stayed up late that Mm -hmm. night. And he had a great time overall. And I think everyone just had a good time with uh, all of the different sparklers and... The, all the different there was a new firework I'd never seen before, but it was kind of like a drone or a hot air balloon type thing. Yeah, I called it the rich man's firework because <laughs> I've never seen anything like it. And maybe people already they're like, No, I grew up with those, but it was one that they lit up and it very slowly just went up into the sky and continued until <laughs> for fucking ever. I'm pretty sure it was just a lantern. I think people just got lanterns and set them up. That was a lot. I think it was it was a lot of them though. Yeah, like, why just a like bunch four of four or five? I don't know. They probably just buy a bunch of lanterns, and maybe that's just what they do. Because I've never seen them before, and we grew up with like cool fireworks. Maybe it's more newer, advanced fireworks that maybe. we just don't know about. Because now they like when we when you see them at Disney, they have them in shapes, which mm-hmm. that wasn't a thing when I was growing up. You just had the circle ones, but at Disney they have like the heart ones, and they've got these. Mickey sort of shaped ones. They'll make yeah, Mickey ears out of them. They but... have Moana's necklace thing, the mm-hmm. little swirl. They got those. Yeah, they got some cool ones. Smiley faces. So that that's what makes me think that this was some newer advanced firework <laughs> that I don't know about because I don't buy fireworks. Right. But soon, who knows what kind of fucking things we're going to have. Oh, the neighbors also shot. Like, <laughs> you you notice this. You tell the story. <laughs> well, so, the, yeah, the neighbor was shooting the ones that just go like, pew! and like shoot like straight up right (laughs) and i guess they didn't aim it up (laughs) so the backs of all the fences are open and there's like a big retention pond but the houses are all in a circle right so you can see into your neighbor's backyard well the firework fell or they didn't line it up right or something so it shot straight into the neighbors across the street (laughs) straight into their backyard i was like well that yard is on fire (laughs) Yeah, that's one thing that I know my sister was worried about is mm-hmm. the lawn catching on fire, but it had been raining all week. This is things like in California where it's just a drought for months. That's the shit you got to worry about, mm-hmm. like some fires. But in Florida, it's already so humid Ugh. that good luck fire <laughs> ever sparking up. <laughs> it's humid. And then we have a torrential downpour at like 3 mm-hmm. p.m. every single It's really been like 2 p.m. But every single day, it looks like a monsoon outside. And then 10 minutes later, it's done. One of the many joys of living in Florida, but it's fun. I've gotten used to it Mm -hmm. growing up in Illinois and then going here. I don't miss the winters. I enjoy the weather way more here. You don't like shoveling snow? Hell no. Don't miss that. Don't miss the the salt on my car constantly. Mm. eats away at your fucking car. What do you hate more, snow and salt or mosquitoes? Snow and salt. Oh, okay. Hmm. Even though I haven't dealt with it for years, Mm -hmm. I will still say snow and salt. Interesting. I've been in a car accident because of snow. Oh, yeah, I do. I remember that story. Mosquitoes. But I've never been in a car accident because of mosquitoes. <laughs> mosquitoes haven't caused that car accident yet. So you're right. You're right. But that is it, Brocat Core. Thank you so much for tuning in this and every single week. Don't forget, of course, the podcast awards. Huge help telling a friend and someone that is big on DC Comics or the movies or even books in general. Definitely let them know about the reasons I'm Broke Podcast. 
Thank you so much for tuning in. I am your Imper Palp Kelly. And I am Team Magma Grunt Daniel. And Broquette Core. All will be well. I didn't put any credibility on this, and it could be that I end up being wrong about it. Who knows? But what do you think about that rumor that came up out of nowhere for a while of Ryan Reynolds being Zack Snyder's choice for Green Lantern in his cut of the film? What? No. I didn't believe it either. And the one one thing is, uh, and I tweeted this out, but I have no doubt that Zack would handle that character better than what we got in the film. However saying that Ryan portrayed a good Hal Jordan is definitely a a straight up lie. Like, I don't think that spoke Hal Jordan at all to me when I was watching the film. Not at all. And I don't think, again, Zach could take Ryan Reynolds and make him into the Hal Jordan we deserve. But I don't think Zack Snyder saw that movie or any of Ryan's work and went, yeah, that's Green Lantern. (laughs) One of the reasons people think that's true is because Ryan Ryan had been so supportive about the cut. So they're like, maybe he was involved in some way. Or maybe he can just be supportive. Right. Maybe he can just be supportive. It's always possible that someone knows something we don't. I don't know. We could be reporting news that he's confirmed in the movie. But I'm just saying, and I, I would still say it then, that I don't think that he portrayed the Hal Jordan that we know from the comics. Not at all. Absolutely zero percent. But this does lead me to wonder, I wonder what the Snyder cut of Detective Pikachu would be. (laughs) (laughs) You think, well, what are your ideas there? I don't know, but I'm very invested. It would be very dark. Could Tom Strong still be Sinestro in that Detective Pikachu movie? I sure hope so. What Pokemon would he be? He could be Mewtwo. There you go. Oh, my God. He would be fucking Mewtwo. Oh, he'd be such a great Mewtwo. He wouldn't just be like, me, my life, nobody likes me. I was created. He would refer to Pikachu as number 25 instead of (laughs) Pikachu. Yes.